hopefully you'll find it useful and hopefully it will be similar to the kind of thing that you've been looking at in your studies already and will supplement with a few extra examples. Well, I'm going to make a start then. I'm going to turn the webcam off now so it will disappear, but hopefully you can still hear me okay. And I'll go to the presentation. Top with you, so your screen is going to change into my. To ask me a question, you can set your chat panel back on the screen. If you hover your mouse at the top of the screen where it says you're viewing Tanya's desktop, then the whole toolbar come back to view. And if you click on chat, that will bring the chat panel back up in front of you. So you can either keep it open and see people's questions and be able to post your own, or you can, if you want to keep it closed if you find it too distracting. So it's entirely up to you. Okay, let's make a start then with the Cost of Capital Masterclass. This is the overview of what we're going to make up or build up the weighted average cost of capital. Aiming to pull together is the average of all the different sources of finance that a business is as part of its uh, financial structure. Now, likely to include equity, that's our very shares, and debt. So, different types of debt are available. As you can see, it might be non tradable or debt. Some, although not very often, we also have preference shares. So I've just popped those on the presentation as well, just so that we can keep an eye on how we deal with those. To dealing with equity, there are two different calculations that we can do to work out the cost of equity. We can use CAPM. Now, I'm going to detail on CAPM today, just because the session that we've got available, I don't want to do uh, too many things to, to over load you with information. We're going to focus on just a few of these areas today. So the capital asset pricing model, but do be aware that that is an alternative for calculating the cost of equity. The dividend valuation model today, which is a calculation of the cost of equity, but also, as you can see on the screen there, the cost of preference shares. And then the techniques that we need to employ to work out the cost of debt in our business. So depending on whether it's non tradable or tradable. And then tradable. So that would be these things that we call debentures and loan stock and bonds, etc. If tradable, redeemable or convertible. So it's important that whatever exam you're doing, and it looks like you guys are all doing SEMA strategic level, that you the question carefully to understand which type of finance you're working with. Okay, the first thing we're going to have a look at here then is going to be the dividend valuation model. Fill in a bit of information here with the dividend valuation model. I a, a bit I can write on. Of this is a share, an ordinary share, valued at the value of a dividend stream. Which is counted. Return. That's the idea that we're working on. That when you have a share price, practically it's been derived from what we can expect the present value of its future dividend stream to be. And it's discounted at the shareholders' required return. Now, did in here, the cost of capital is that little bit the shareholders required return because that's equal to the of equity. So that 
we know for a lot of shares, their current share price, what we want able to do is rearrange this idea so that we can work out interested in being the cost of equity. We often write it KE. So what we need to be aware of here to calculate KE current dividend at time zero we divide by the price, the current share price. Okay, find the required return of shareholders. We take the current dividend divided by the price. This formula is assuming that constant. Same amount per share every year. And recognizing that, that formula is it is a perpetuity formula. What though, when we have growth to consider? Because in most businesses, either it is or the general uh, for the company is that they want to try and maximize shareholders' wealth. And the ways of proving that they're doing that is growth in dividends. So, how are we building growth here? Relatively straightforward. If we assume constant growth, then the formula just alters ever so slightly to Minus G. The P zero and then add G at the end. Formula is confused then. So dividends are constant, or we take D zero over P zero, but if growth in dividends, we take zero multiplied by one plus the growth rate, we get the current share price and then add in the growth rate at the end. So quite useful if we could see how that works with a little example. I think life is a bit better if you can see them with some numbers. So let's see an example. Has just paid a dividend of ten pence, and expect dividends to grow at five percent per annum. P share price is one pound and five. How to calculate the cost of equity then? With the dividend of ten pence, we're going to divide by one plus the growth rate. By the current share price. Now be very careful here. Our dividend is in pence and the pence there is in pounds. So we have to make sure that they are consistent. So convert price into pence 105 pence and on the end there. 0 0.05. Calculation into calculators. We have with a cost of equity of 50%. Okay, our first little calculation there. Similar calculation here in example two. I just want to illustrate, first of all, the difference. Example 2, DPLC is about to pay a dividend of 15 pence. Now, be careful if it says that, because that will have an impact on our share price. What is that the share price is the come It includes. That's it. 
pay. Now, this calculation, the figure that we should have in our formula, just for a second, this E0 that we talk about as the share price, it should be referred to as ex-div. It is excluding the dividend. The share price as this dividend has already been paid. So how impact on our calculation then? Well, what we make sure we do is that when we calculate P0 to go into the formula, the dividend. So that's the price, and we subtract the dividend. That gives us a share price then. So calculating the cost of equity is the same. Dividend of 15 pence. We buy one plus the rate, so 0.06, by the share price, and it's that X div price that we want, that we've just calculated there, and then add on the growth. So this time, with a cost equity, of 20%. Okay. Valuation model. So that we would use using the cost of equity using EVM. So as we've just said, equity is the current dividend divided by 1 plus the growth rate divide the X div share price, then we're on the growth rate. Now, preference shares, one of the features of preference shares, they have constant dividends. Dividends never grow. They are quoted as a percentage of the nominal value of the share. Same every year. It means that when we calculate the cost of preference shares, KP, we just have a simpler version of the formula, the dividend over the current share price. As far as equity is concerned, that's just an evaluation model. I've got the alternative, capital asset pricing model, which you do to know for your exam. So do make sure you're up to speed on that one as well. For a second, and I'm just going to pause to see if anybody's got any questions on what we've covered so far. So if you can get your chat panel up by just hovering at the top of the page and clicking the chat. Okay, well, it all seems so far. Wonderful. Feel so free to interrupt me at any point if you do have any questions on the chat panel. Have a look at then is debt. So, understand first of all, what kind of debt do we have? Not all would include things like bank loans, straightforward to deal with. Debt, as I say, covers things like loan stock, the different terminology that the examiners use, but we do it the same way. Debentures, 
term for them. As to which of those terms they use, we do it in the same way. And it will depend on the characteristics of that debt. Is it redeemable? And with immovable debt, we test in perpetuity and payment of the debt. Debt that both interest and so repayment. A debtable debt is interest and redemption, which may take the form of cash or it may take the form of shares. Now, the least common one that you see in the exam simple to deal with as long as we follow the rules for redeemable debt. What have a look at now is how to deal with debt. Okay, so as I've put on the screen now, one of the things we have to watch out for with debt is tax. Because interest is tax deductible. Or another thing is we get tax relief on interest payments. This is that the required return our debt investors not equal the cost of debt to the company. Okay, it's different to equity. We have the required return of shareholders and the cost of equity with the same thing. Now, they're the same here because of the tax bit cheaper as far as the company are concerned because they get tax relief on the best payments that they make. In mind then, the way that we calculate the cost of debt for our bank loans is the interest rate and we multiply by 1 minus the tax rate. Forward calculation that we've got a bank loan paying 8% interest and the company pay corporate tax at 30%. In this case, the cost of debt will just be 8 multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate by 0.7. That's the cost of debt of 5.6%. Okay, getting 8%, it only costs the company 5.6% because they get tax relief on their interest. Now, double debt is dealt with in quite a similar way, except because a redeemable debt is tradable, what we bring in is the market value of that debt. So the cost of debt would be the interest rate multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate multiplied by the market value of the debt. Example, so we put some numbers into it. I have the example I've just popped on the screen there. A irredeemable debt trading at £40 X interest. The rate is 5%, and the rate of tax is 28%. Point out to you here. With we talk about debt, 
blocks of $100 or £100, use the same currency. So, blocks of £100 nominal value. Okay, I have a number of these different uh, blocks of debt, but they're based around a book value or a nominal value of £100. With the whole amount of debt, we chunk it back down into these blocks, which makes it much easier to deal with. And it says shares will have a nominal value. So you quite often see on the balance sheet ordinary shares of one pound value. In life, they might be trading at a different amount. That's common that the market price of the shares is different from the nominal value. The same thing occurs with debt. That was. Is a hundred as this example the market value of each at forty pounds. This terminology of coupon rate. Coupon rate is the interest on the debt. A percentage is always applied to the nominal value. For example, in this one. Block of debt, investor, times interest. Okay, that's just a little bit of background. Let's do the calculation here for the cost of debt. The cost of debt is the interest. So, five. Multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate, so 1 is 28% will be 0.72, dividing the current market value. 5 is multiplied by 0.72, divided by 40, cost of debt of 9%. How we deal with our irredeemable debt. Now, debt is treated a little bit differently. Back to our with redeemable debt, it's a different technique. Quite as straightforward. Calculate the IR, so the internal rate return, flows associated with the debt. Current market value, and again we work in blocks of a hundred. Interest, net of tax, and the redemption value. So we're going to be repaying the debt at. In order to calculate the IRR, just like if you're doing an IRR on an investment, calculate two net present values. Two different discount rates to calculate your net present value. And in which you use, we want one positive and one negative net present value so that we can use linear interpretation to calculate the IRR. The table there on the screen, that's what we use to calculate our cost of example. Numbers. The company has in issue 12% redeemable debt with years until redemption, which will be par. Now, par is 
just a net word or a couple of words for the nominal value, which at the death will be a hundred pounds. The market value is a hundred and seven pounds fifty, and tax is paid at twenty eight percent. Okay, so let's just set up our little table working here. to begin with. Leave a bit of space on the end of the page. In year zero, now we want the current market value of the debt. And then 107.59. The reason that to make the calculation work, we begin as a negative figure. Think of it as a cash outflow but it does go in as negative. These go in as positive figures because, in effect, we're setting them against each other. So we've now got five years until redemption. So in the next five years, interest less next is going to be percent of hundred. So that pounds. And we've got to do interest less tax. Multiply by one minus the tax rate. So by point seven two gives us annual interest sixty four. And then five have the redemption value. This is going to be redeemed at par, which is a hundred pounds. So the cash flows. What we've got to do now is discount them. Now, at what discount rate you choose to begin with. So I ten percent to start with. Zero. I don't count factor there because it's already at present value. Fifty nine annual amount of eight sixty four over five years. Here, want my annuity factor or my cumulative discount factor five years at ten percent. Three seven nine one. Remember, be able to extract that from the tables that you in the exam. You won't work that out. You can just cut five years and see factor. So multiply that by 864 to give us a present value of 3275. I want to say that it doesn't hear me. And um, can you else hear me okay? Can you just pop a little yes on the chat panel to let me know? that you can hear me. Let's carry on then. Here's the present value of this redemption value. So in five years' time, we therefore need a discount factor of 0.621, which again you'll be able to get from rules. So those present values. a negative 1274. So one positive and one negative NPV. We've got one. It's the discount rate to try and get a positive one. So we'll do the same exercise again for using 5%. 
market value is 759 and the cumulative discount factor is 329 multiply that by the cash flow of 864 gives us 3740 We've got our discount factor 0 0.784 840. Now this hopefully will get a positive figure. This is positive 821. So that the cost of debt therefore lies somewhere between 5% and 10%. If you know what the IRR does, let me just remind you of the little formula, is it looks for the discount rate that brings the present value of your cash flows back to zero. Like a given discount rate, if you like. So if we're looking for the discount rate that equates value with the redemption value. The cost of debt to the company. So that we tend to use for IR. And there's other ways you can write this. You might have seen it written differently. This is the one I like, which stands for the low discount rate. Now, 5% is our low rate. Now, TV that we achieved at that rate. Divide NL minus NH. NH is the NPV at the higher rate. Multiplied by H minus L. The high rate of 10% minus the low rate of 5. Using the numbers from our example and plugging into this formula, we end up with 5. Twenty one. Eight twenty one. And normal here because it's minus, and this is minus figure, so it becomes a plus. Twenty four. Five by ten minus five. Now into your calculator. Do eight twenty one. Divided by, and you can put that bit in brackets, 821 plus 74. 5 by the 10 minus 5 on this 5 at the beginning. That comes out with. And we have 7%. Sample, the cost of our irredeemable debt is 7%. There's quite a bit there. Let's go back to our original overview diagram. Then at our bank loans, we said the cost of is just the interest multiplied by one minus the tax rate. For irredeemable debt, it was very similar. It multiplied by one minus the tax rate, but divided by the market value. And then for redeemable debt, it was calculating the R of your cash flows. Which we put into interest multiplied by one minus the tax rate and the option value. Here, convertible debt. Unique for convertible debt 
is exactly the same as redeemable debt. Except to watch out for here is redemption value. Already, redemption might take the form of cash or take the form of shares. An example on this one, because as I say, it's very similar to redeemable debt to make sure that you calculate that redemption value correctly. I'll emphasize what happens with convertible debt, just look out for the redemption value, which is of the cash that we're offering or the value of the shareholding that your investors can convert to on that redemption date. Say, apart from that, that is the only difference with flexible debt. There for a second, and I've got that panel open. Any questions on anything that we've done so far? coming in but as I say do feel free to post them as we go on. Oh Angus, uh, whose prediction does the value of the shareholding? Um, it will be given in the question Angus. So say is that the current share price is share and that is expected to grow five percent per annum. In this case you would then just take current share price by 1.05 to the number of however many years until redemption. Okay, I'll give you all the information needed there in the question. To your question. Brilliant. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, so how do we bring all this together then? Because what we ultimately need to do is to be able to calculate the average cost of capital. Calculate the WAC. There's lots of different formulas, and in your material, it often makes it look more complicated than it needs to be. What we do here is take our cost of equity multiplied by the market value of equity, the preference shares multiplied by the market value of the preference shares, cost of debt multiplied by the market value of debt. By the total market value of all different sources of finance. Okay, so let's pop some numbers into it. Let's say that we've got some T at 15% cost and market value of one. Preference shares with a 8% and a value of 200,000. And say we've got the debt, and we've got the cost of debt to be 6% of 700,000 market value. So say we've worked all of that out. How do we calculate the WAC? All we going to do is 15% multiply. by 200,000 multiplied by 700,000 and by 
need a million. That's all sources of finance that are added together. Pop to our calculators. Is a weighted average cost of capital of 11%. See, it's somewhere in between the cost of all of our different sources of finance. We have some different formulas to calculate WAC in your exams. Uh, in your S3, they give you a formula on the formula sheet. That gives you the same answer, but consuming. So this is just a little shortcut to get calculation. You use it as you put the figures into the formulas that you're given, you'll come up with exactly the same answer. The first thing I want to mention then is when do we tend to use this weight average cost of capital? Quite often get some written questions asking you about the appropriate your written questions as well as your calculations. It's really, really important that you can do those as well because they are very common in the exams. So can you use it? First of all, you could use it for very small, insignificant investments. Significant compared to the total market value of the company very small, then it's not going to have a very big impact on the company. But if you're using them for bigger investments, the key thing to do is look at the risk of the project or the risk of the investment. And it must be consistent with the current risk of the company. Now, about risk, we should break that down into business and financial risk. Risk in relation to the industry. And here is that the investment in the same activities or at least similar activities. Business. Not there's an alternative. And what we tend to do is we calculate a risk adjusted capital. Doing F3, I know a lot of you have said you're doing F3. You see this to be using CAPM your cost of equity. There, we can do something called unring and hearing our beaters. Okay, I'm going to go over in this masterclass, but that's what you would do in that scenario. Now, financial risk changed. Well, financial risk refers to the level of gearing in business. To equity ratio. Slightly to change as a result of the project, again, the existing weighted average cost of capital were relevant because based on your existing debt to equity ratio. Now, changes the technique that we would generally use that is something called APV. Adjusted present value. Again, something we're covering here, but just to give you a, a background as to where that comes from, it's because the whack wouldn't be appropriate if our gearing level changed. That's our 
Denmark Masterclass on Cost of Capital. If you have any questions, then do feel free to ask me those questions now. I'll keep the chat open here so that you can ask your questions. Uh, the, the going forward is practice, practice, practice. You'll get used to doing these calculations is seeing them in lots of questions. So formulas now. What you're doing make go away and you have a look at past exam questions to understand the context of calculations get tested. And that be different depending on the exam that you're doing. But the basics remain the same. Okay. So take you back to the WebEx home screen now. So I will keep the chat panel open. If you have any questions, please post them there. And well, I hope to look forward to seeing on a class in the future. Of Kaplan, don't forget to check out our exam tips site. There are loads of free resources that you can get your hands on, including the recording of this masterclass in a couple of days' time. We'll be posting that up, so you can watch it all over again if you want to, or if you want to over any bits that you missed, you can do so. And Others on the Kaplan Exam Tips website, there are lots of other masterclasses and there's also a great exam emergency service where you can post questions to choose who will be responding to them and just a bit closer to the exams. So the Kaplan Exam Tips website is really useful resources or any uh, tips on courses you want to do with Kaplan and you can do it live online the same way as if we've just been doing this masterclass, then have a look at our website, Kaplan Financial. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening today. I'm going to switch the webcam off, but I'll stay here for a couple of minutes to answer any questions that you may have. I do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for logging in.